In 1929, the United States was devastated by the Great Depression. Families went hungry, jobs became fewer, and unemployment and homelessness skyrocketed to levels the country had never seen before, nor since. And while the majority of the decade that preceded it has been remembered for its elaborate celebrations, style, and music, the cracks had been forming for years, ultimately leading to one of the most difficult times in the United States' history, putting the government in a difficult spot. What they did next would go down as one of the most controversial policies in U.S. history, confiscating the gold of Americans by threat of imprisonment and fines. Was this a necessary use of government power to help heal a wounded economy? or a breach of government trust in a person's right to own private property. I'll leave that up to you to decide as we learn something new. On November 8, 1918, a celebration occurred across Manhattan's Fifth Avenue. Workers threw makeshift confetti from their offices, a conga line was breaking out in the street, and everyone was looking toward a brighter future. There were two main reasons for this monumental gathering. The first was that the city's death rate from their devastating influenza outbreak was finally beginning to fall. After over 675,000 Americans had perished from the disease, the average age of death being 28 years old, people were finally easing their concerns about catching such a deadly disease. The second and more direct reason for the festivities was due to a report from the United Press that there was finally an armistice in Europe, ending World War I. One. While this was actually a mistake, the war wouldn't end for a few more days, the people of New York were undeterred. It was with this enthusiasm that America was entering the Roaring Twenties. And the 1920s was an incredible decade for America, with the gross national product skyrocketing 40% between 1922 and 1929. This was in part due to what's known as the Second Industrial Revolution, brought about by new technologies formed from the use of electricity, as well as the new manufacturing ideas of Ford's assembly line permeating into each and every company. Suddenly, a car could be put together in 93 minutes, which Americans could purchase with the ever-increasingly popular personal credit lines being extended mostly throughout the middle-class homes, allowing approximately one-fifth of Americans to own a car by the end of the decade. Materialism was in, as was cultural movements like swing jazz and flapper dresses. But there was a dark side to the 20s as well, with the prohibition giving organized crime a platform to rise up around, leading to the the creation of nearly 30,000 speakeasies in New York City alone. And while some certainly enjoyed Gatsby levels of opulence and glamour, that would really only be reserved for the upper crust of society. Even throughout the 20s, cracks were already starting to form that would send the US into a near economic death spiral. The farmers of America had a bad time during the 20s. While they had enjoyed a decade of success in the 1910s, with the Great War causing demand for agricultural products to soar, with European suppliers out of the picture, and the US government was egging them on to produce as much as possible. And they did as they were told. But going into the 20s, this presented a problem, as many of their workers or family members opted to choose work in the cities where the Second Industrial Revolution was taking place, while others suffered losses from influenza, the farming communities found that they were short-staffed. Not only that, but they were suffering from success as once Europe recovered enough to begin shipping out food of their own, the farmers who were still growing as much as they could saw the prices of their crops plummet, to the point where they couldn't grow enough to support their basic expenses. And attempting to grow more to offset the lower sale prices only made the problem worse. An estimated 60 of every 1,000 farmers filed for bankruptcy. And then, in August of 1929, the Great Depression started. It was on October 24th, 1929, that investors began selling off shares in mass. 13 million in total. Five days later, 16 million were sold, leaving many shares completely worthless. Throughout the 20s, consumer spending had been going up constantly, but by early 1929, consumers began to buy less. Unsold goods being churned out in the optimized factories began to pile up and the rise of personal debt was beginning to hit home for many people. Banks, too, had excessive amounts of loans that they couldn't pay. 
and President Herbert Hoover assured the public that it would pass. But over the next three years, it got even worse. Homes foreclosed on, bread lines and soup kitchens popped up as people's only way to eat after the country's industrial production dropped by half, leading to record unemployment. Farmers now couldn't afford to harvest their crops and often left them rotting in the fields until eventually severe droughts hit from Texas to Nebraska, causing the Dust Bowl, killing off livestock and crops, forcing people into cities to find work where none existed. By the end of 1930, bank runs had swept the nation, thousands of banks eventually closing their doors and no amount of Hoover's government loans were stemming the flow of failing banks. This was the state of the country when Franklin D. Roosevelt won an overwhelming election. By the time he was inaugurated, all remaining banks had closed to stop the bank runs, but the newly elected FDR was firm in his optimism about turning the country around, declaring, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, in his address to the nation. But there was still plenty of worry around the nation. FDR wasted no time trying to course correct on the economy, but he knew that in order to get things back on track, he would need to take drastic action. According to Keynesian economic theory, one of the best ways to fight off an economic downturn is to inflate the money supply. But the United States was on the gold standard, meaning that for every dollar held, there was an amount of gold at banks that the dollar could be exchanged for. The dollar had a physical object tied to its value, but the banks had been swarmed by worried people that were all swapping out their dollars for gold during the bank runs and hoarding the gold back home. So on June 5th, Roosevelt effectively ended the gold standard, preceded by one of the most controversial US government overreaches of all time. On April 5th, 1933, Roosevelt signed Executive Order 6102, forbidding the hoarding of gold within the continental United States. This meant that banks would no longer convert dollars to gold. It prohibited ownership of more than five ounces of gold, and all Americans were required to sell their gold to the Federal Reserve for $20.67 per ounce. Those that refused to comply faced a $10,000 fine, 10 years in prison, or both. Following this, Congress passed the Gold Reserve Act, and Roosevelt artificially raised the price of gold from $20 the Americans had been paid to $35. This devalued the US dollars they had exchanged the gold for and increased inflation. Gold was now illegal to own, and the US was flush with so much that they had to create a place to store it all. So in 1936, the US Bullion Depository, better known as Fort Knox, was built to hold more than half of all the gold in the United States. And gold would continue to be illegal to own for the next 40 years, until President Richard Nixon formally abandoned the quasi-gold standard the US had been on since and completely separated the US dollar from gold with Executive Order 11825 repealing Executive Order 6102. In the end, after making numerous other efforts contained within FDR's New Deal, reforming banking laws, work relief, and agricultural programs, as well as the later establishment of Social Security, helped provide stability to an economy that was just trying to get by. But Executive Order 6102 was a frightening example of the lengths the government can go to when they feel drastic action is necessary. While it's fair to say that this has been seen as controversial today, it's also important to point out that it wasn't popular at the time either, despite wide compliance. One senator from Roosevelt's own party was asked his opinion on the executive order by the president himself, responding, why that's just plain stealing, isn't it Mr. President? Thank you for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe so you can see more like it in the future. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.